to NewsClick. Uh, today is International Day of Women, and uh, 2021 and 2020 were not exactly easy years uh, for women. Uh, we have with us a uh, well, very special guest to speak about this day, uh, Keithi Singh. She's a well-known advocate. She also fights uh, women for women. She's an activist, and she is going to tell us. Uh, Keithi, welcome to the show. Um, Thank you. Um, what was the last year like for women? Was it different from uh, the uh, last year when we marked International Day of Women? Uh, was, the, was the environment very different for women then? Well, not very different, but last year also was a, a dark period in the history of women's movement. Uh, there was several uh, cases that didn't happen some with, in which there were negative uh, interpretations of the law. There were uh, certain comments from courts and uh, a couple of cases in which we saw a ray of hope perhaps. You so know, last year comments, was... Uh, yes, sorry, uh, when we talk about comments, uh, this, uh, 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 you know, this very month we uh, had the Chief Justice uh, of India make a comment related to a, a, a rape survivor uh, where he asked the perpetrator, the alleged perpetrator was asked whether he would like to marry the woman. Now, the man said uh, that, you know, he is already married. So in a sense, the court was it uh, ready to set up a precedent saying that, okay, this is a solution I come up with. What do you make of this remark? You know, the, there have been quite a few cases now in which the court has asked the couple to marry after a rape has taken place. And the uh, primary objection of women's groups and of AIDWA, which I have been aligned with, uh, is, has been that this should never be done. In this particular case, the Chief Justice said, uh, if you've seduced and raped this woman, why shouldn't you marry her? Seduction is, of course, implies consent of a kind. But rape a woman, first of all, we felt that a man should not be asked that because the woman hadn't said that she wanted to marry him. If you know that we have a patriarchal norms which flourish in our society. So if the mother had said, agreed to get the party is married. It's because she felt she had to save the honor of the uh, of the girl and the family, which is quite wrong. I mean, honor is not saved by this kind of uh, alliance. And the bottom line that uh, women's organization wanted to say was, how can you marry a, a girl to a person who has brutalized her, to a person who has uh, actually, you know, committed rape on her. And in this particular case, it was quite a horrible story. The man had committed rape on her for 10, 12 times in a clandestine manner. He had tied her down. He had, uh, uh, to, you know, threatened her that he will throw acid on her. And the girl had tried to commit suicide after that. And the girl didn't want to marry this person at all. And once you say that, you know, why don't you get married? What you're doing actually is, actually you don't realize what happens uh, on the woman's body. You don't think of the woman's perspective. Uh, you don't, um, you don't sort of minimize the fact that uh, a violent, particularly violent act has taken place without the girl's consent. And uh, that uh, it's not acceptable for her to then be with the person who has, who has committed this violent act. So whether the family wants it or not, whether anybody else wants it or not, we feel, women's groups feel, that um, this should, marriage should never be offered as a solution because it is not a solution. You know, 
uh, even if you look at one of the states where you get a lot of bad news uh, about women uh, recurrently is Uttar Pradesh. Uh, uh, many people have seen the recent laws uh, related to love jihad as an attempt to control women. Uh, do you agree? And how do these law works? The courts have given, um, you know, in, in UP itself, the courts have tried to uh, sort of uh, control the uh, uh, real effect of these laws. Uh, what what is really going on? Why are we having these sudden uh, love jihad issues? <clears throat> yes. So first, I just want to complete the first point because another uh, uh, state, I mean, another not statement or another uh, you know uh, question, rhetorical question, perhaps or whatever it is, that was raised uh, in the Chief Justice's court was. Uh, uh, you know, can a, 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 a brutality ever amount to rape if the parties are married? Yes. So, yes. I, I mean, women's groups and others have been fighting for a change of law to, to, uh, to you know, recognize marital rape. And this has been going on for years. And we think it's unacceptable even in intimate relationships for uh, you know, this to happen, for violence to take place. So uh, what is unacceptable to the women's groups is perhaps acceptable in cer to certain people, uh, uh, which is a sort of patriarchal thinking part of our society. As far as the UP law is concerned, it's a draconian legislation and it violates both the freedom uh, to uh, freedom of choice, which is a part of a fundamental freedom flowing from Article 21, and it violates the freedom to convert. And it is a draconian measure because after the, after the Allahabad case, in which the court actually wrongly refused to protect a young couple who had who were being hounded by the girl's parents? The court said, "No, we are not inclined to protect them because the girl had got con converted just a year, month before, and uh, therefore we will not protect them." Uh, which which is amazing because as surely the constitution allows for protection uh, in a situation in which there is violence in which a, situa a situation in which the girl's side is hounding the girl and the, and the boy. But the uh, Yogi Adityanath government said that they, there are too many cases of love jihad that are happening and we are going to see that he threatened that uh, this does not happen again. In fact, he said they, they'll be forced to say Ram Nam Satya and brought in this legislation, which is quite atrocious, which is quite unconstitutional. I do hope that the, uh, you know, that the courts will declare it to be so. And currently it is being challenged in the Allahabad uh, High Court and the High Court has uh, protected a couple who has appeared before it. But apart from that, what does it, this particular ordinance actually uh, says that uh, conversion itself is wrong, you know, that it sees that if somebody yeah. coerces, if a third party coerces another, or, um, you know, it, it's a very wide uh, draft uh, section because it says coercion and other things. And then it says, or by marriage converts yeah. another. And then it says anybody who facilitates that will also be punished. So a wide range of people can be uh, punished under it. And even gifting a person something can be a, a problem as far as the definition is concerned. You know, uh, so that's a facilitation also. Uh, then apart from that, it puts the onus of proof on the person who has uh, who is alleged to have converted another person. So with the result, what is happening is that uh, you don't have to prove that you're innocent. It is not presumed that you're innocent as it ordinarily is in law. It is presumed that you're guilty till you establish innocence, which is why the police have gone on a rampage in UP. 
And you okay. know, in the Hindu reported that uh, uh, as of 16th of January, there are 54 or some such number of people who have been arrested under the ordinance. And, uh, uh, you know, sections of the uh, political right, like Bajranda, for instance, are busy targeting Muslim boys. Overwhelming number of people who have been arrested are, of course, Muslims and their Muslim boys and their families. Right. So let us be clear who this uh, uh, ordinance was targeting. It was uh, people who, they, who the UP government claimed was indulging in love jihad, which is a completely fictional uh, thing, which in, in which the government alleges that Muslim boys are marrying Hindu girls to convert them to Islam. This, I mean, and it's been brought up in court again and again. And the courts have, in fact, asked NIA in the uh, Hadia case, the NIA investigated. And no, nowhere has it been found that there is a conspiracy to do this. But yet, uh, UP government insists, the Madhya Pradesh government is following suit and the other... BJP state governments are also following suit, uh, you know, and uh, uh, we have this whole phenomen phenomena which is no non-existence being justified and young people who dare to fall in love, uh, not being allowed to uh, get together and choose despite being uh, the right to choose a fundamental right, as I said. And right. this has been pronounced in the privacy judgment, for instance, put to Swami's judgment, in which it was clearly uh, stated, and I would like to uh, quote that, but apart from the put to Swami judgment also, this was, um, <clears throat> you know, held in the uh, Hadia case. So it was in put to Swami's judgment, for instance, uh, uh, they, the court had interpreted Article 21 as an article which gave all persons the right to privacy and choice and observed, and I quote, privacy enables the individual to retain the autonomy of his body and mind and entitles an individual to mental and physical integrity and to freedom of thought and self-determination. In the Hatia case also, the Supreme Court had uh, laid stress on the right to choice as a constitutional and human right, the containment of which would destroy the individualistic entity of a person. And these judgments were again quoted in the Rava judgment, which, uh, uh, which said that the right to live with a person of his or her choice, irrespective of religion professed by them is intrinsic to right to life and personal liberty. Interference in a personal liberty uh, or relationship uh, would constitute a serious encroachment into the right to freedom of choice of the two individuals. Now, in spite of that, we have this draconian um, ordinance. And one of the sections of this ordinance, which I would like to mention, is section six, which says that before you convert, you have to give a declaration of it. Right. You know, two months before you convert to the uh, uh, magistrate, and the magistrate will then launch, uh, you know, uh, investigation through the police, and the police will find out what the real intentions of the couple are. I mean, imagine a situation, and you can imagine what the consequences will be, because now okay. they have the power to go into your mind to decide whether you are, you know, converting or not of your own free will and what are the reasons and whether there has been allurement for your conversion or not. Yes, and it is also a way to control uh, women, right? Of not just the Muslim the men who may It is a way to control women and their body and do not allow them any choice over themselves. So it attacks women at, uh, you know, very fundamental level. At a very, very control. fundamental level. You know, there was also a, a very gruesome incident in Uttar Pradesh, which was uh, talked about a lot, which is the Hathras 
uh, gang rape uh, incident. Now, you know, compare it with the uh, Love Jihad law, which says that uh, converting a Dalit woman would uh, involve a very high uh, punishment, a higher uh, degree of penalty. But when it comes to the dignity of a Dalit woman, uh, uh, otherwise, uh, there doesn't seem to be any interest. Yes. So, uh, you know, what, what is this? Yes, in fact, uh, obviously in Hatras, the, U, uh, uh, the UP's Thakur's uh, reign. And in fact, it mm -hmm. was uh, the, uh, you know, the, it, it was the rape of a Dalit girl by a member of the Thakur clan. And uh, Yet we see all kinds, uh, I mean, all kinds of um, uh, inefficient or, or, or deliberately inefficient handling by the police in this case. In this case, we see how the administration and the police and the hospital authorities can all connive and uh, not allow no. justice to take, uh, prevail. Because in the first instance, though the girl, she, in fact, said it to an India Today journalist, you know, and that was that video was widely uh, shown. Right. Though the girl said there had been Zabardasti with her and rape, uh, there was no medical examination carried out. The medical examination was carried out eight days after the incident. And the girl clearly again said that she, Zabardasti had been done with her and rape had taken place. And lo and behold, her forensic samples are sent for finding semen after 10 days of the rape. By that time, she had been washed, her clothes had been cleaned. There was no hope uh, that any semen would be found in her body. And yet the doctor, when he was asked if, on physical examination what he found, he said, there had been force, but I can't give a final opinion about, uh, you know, rape as I'm waiting for the forensic reports. How could a medical doctor say that? How can he say that? I mean, he knows that no semen will be found. And then the ADJ of Hatras pronounces that there's no, uh, no rape has taken place because no semen is found. Right. So, I mean, these kind of horrendous things happen here. And then the Mahapanchaya, there's a Mahapanchayat of the, uh, you know, Thakurs in Hatras claiming yeah. that no rape has taken place and our boy is being falsely, uh, you know, targeted. And, you know, thank God, uh, it, the, um, there's a Delhi High Court Lawyers, um, Heli, uh, Women Lawyers Association, which filed a PIL in the Supreme Court in this case. And they got some significant orders because the order that they got was one that uh, the girl's family will be protected by the CRPF. Two, that the Allahabad High Court will monitor the case, you see? And that was very significant. And of course, by that time, the girl's lawyer also appeared. Then uh, she said she would ask for transfer of the case to Delhi at a later stage, of course, and I hope she does. But this is where the case lies. The girl, you know, actually had made what is called a dying declaration in law. And that dying declaration has a sanctity in law. And she had said that she had been raped. She had named the people who had raped her. So it was all there. And I hope the courts consider it as a, uh, as a dying declaration because it was after that she died, poor thing. And you know the manner in which her burial took place, uh, I mean, her cremation took place um, in a very surreptitious manner by the UP police. Right. So this was a lesson. The Hathras case was a lesson to us. And what is it? And prior to that, of course, we've seen what happened. There was the Katwa case, there was the Unao case. And then also after the Katwa case, the Modi government came out uh, with, um, with the law, which sort of punished, which was supposed to be punishing rapists. And what right. did they do? They introduced the death penalty in the law of rape. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, uh, 
against the trend uh, in a number of, uh, you know, quite a few countries across the world, and against what human rights activists had also been arguing in India, that death penalty shouldn't be given for a rape. But uh, the, anyway, and that presumes that every rapist will be caught. But the truth of the matter here is that when investigation is not done properly, when you are uh, the police, when you don't have enough forensic labs, when you know that the police are botching up uh, the investigation as they are in several cases, right. then I mean the certainty of conviction is something that we must try to assure, assure the, rather than the you know uh, gravity of punishment because punishment I, yes. by killing would some people said it would result in rapists killing of their uh, killing of young children some said yes. the complaints won't be coming uh, complaints won't come because if the if the person who's the rapist is somebody known to the family or close to them, then it won't be coming out. So I, it, it's interesting that conservative governments keep on increasing the punishment uh, uh, and saying that this will be the solution to the problem, whereas it isn't. It is as we have clearly discussed, it is the, the manner in which the investigation is done, the kind of investigation that it's done, the tools that are available to the investigative authority that will determine right. the outcome of the case and uh, determine whether the person will be found guilty or not. Now, now if we move from the uh, village back to the city. Uh, Bangalore had uh, uh, Disha Ravi was arrested from Bangalore and whisked away. And then, you know, we did see that, you know, she was given a rather long uh, custody uh, with the police. And, and then, then the court did uh, allow her out on bail. Why, why do you think, uh, you know, this, this uh, is it relevant that she's a woman in, in this particular matter? You know, during, the, during the last year, there have been several women who have been uh, incarcerated for participating, um, yeah. participating in, the, uh, in various struggles. And uh, of course, these include Disha Ravi, these include Nodeep Kaur, Devangana, Kalita, Natasha Narwal, Gulfisha Fatima, Isra Jahan, Safura Zargar, and so on. So these women have been participating equally uh, in all these, um, you know, that uh, the anti-CA protests, for, for instance, were largely led by women with others participating. Right. But these, these women have been in the forefront of struggles and we are proud of that. And um, of course, when you look at Disha Ravi's case, what was the police doing here again in that? She was whisked to Delhi uh, on the weekend without a transit bail being uh, got, which the Delhi High Court has said is necessary in her case. Then she was produced here. Her lawyer wasn't here. I mean, lawyer wasn't present in court. And the magistrate mindlessly sent her back and uh, sent her, demanded her to, you know, police custody. Right. And, you know, this is a problem in our country because as Justice Deepak Gupta, the others of the, uh, you know, the ex-justice of the Supreme Court said the other day, the magistrates don't apply their mind as they are supposed to before remanding a person to police or judicial custody. They don't read the files even. They are scared in perhaps doing so. And without application of mind, they fail in their constitutional duty to remand or not to remand perhaps a person. Like Disha Ravi should not have been remanded. And an ADJ quite rightly held after that, you know, that um, uh, uh, amendment of a toolkit 
is not a crime. It's, it can't be labeled uh, a major crime. Uh, um, and uh, he doesn't see any seditious intent in it. So, and the freedom of expression is a right that all Indians have. And if you, whether you're talking to uh, people in foreign countries or in India, it doesn't really matter. You're not, you're, uh, a, a toolkit is meant to expand uh, agitation and surely to agitate is not right. a crime. And it's good that the judge said that in this particular case. Uh, and talked of the freedom of expression, because the freedom of expression is being quite gutted in our country. The, the meaning of a democracy is that people are able to speak their mind. And yet we see in case after case, uh, legislations like, you know, uh, the UAPA being, uh, you know, uh, uh, used legisl uh, and uh, right. sections like the sedition section in the IPC uh, being used just to keep these people in jail and see that they are not given bail for a long time because under the UP UAPA you can do that. It has a loose definition of terrorism and a regular bail is sometimes not given for 180 days. You know, the thing is that we often talk about the chilling effect of uh, application of very stringent laws. Do you think women are going to stop protesting? There'll be fewer and fewer voices. Yes, sure, Do you think that will happen? Would be after eight days of incarceration. And, you know, uh, as I said, the ADJ had made positive remarks about the freedom of expression. But, oh, yes, yes. there is a chilling effect. There's a chilling effect. People are scared to speak. People are scared to go to jail for God knows how many days. I mean, in Safura's case, uh, bail was actually uh, given to her on humanitarian grounds, on very uh, stringent conditions. But others like Natasha, Vivangana, they remain in jail, you know, and they are not given jail because there are multiple FIRs filed against them. And uh, the, the people outside can see, the public can see what is, how a vindictive action is being taken against these, uh, I would say, innocent young people who are dare, just daring to raise their voice and disagree with the government and uh, who are exercising their freedom of expression, which is their basic right. So, but these actions of the government do have a completely chilling effect and uh, people are scared to speak their mind. And that is what I think the government is hoping for, that people will not express themselves. People will not say anything against them because anytime anybody speaks, they are called anti-nationals, they are called unpatriotic. And, uh, you know, there are barrage of criticisms. What is the way out? There, there has to be a solution. If uh, you know, uh, you you know, I do you see that people will just do nothing about it? Women have come out in the large uh, largest numbers we've ever seen since Shaheen Bag. Uh, you know, is 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 more protest going to be an answer to the chilling effect of uh, the law? Yes, we have to keep on struggling. We have no option. Our backs are against the wall. Unless women keep on struggling, they will not achieve anything. And they have to keep on fighting. And perhaps they will. It's sad to think what is going to happen to some of them. But I think they have no options. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much for your time. A very bleak picture, but nevertheless. <laughs> <laughs> That's how it is. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, you, you know, cases like Priya Ramani's case, you give us a ray of yes. hope, though he used uh, Hindu mythology, and uh, mm -hmm. many don't agree with that. But he let, I mean, he had, he saw that the story, that Priya Ramani's story was credible, that he, he appreciated the evidence, and he, you know, uh, squashed the case of defamation right. uh, by MJ Akbar, which was an intimidatory tactic. It was a, it was right. a threatening tactic 
to stop again women from saying that. And yet so many women in that particular case gave their affidavits also. That's right, yes. That they had been uh, sexually harassed by the, uh, by the right. person, you know. But as far as this, All right. yes. No, I just wanted to make one remark. I said, we saw yes. the, uh, how our society tries to control women and how they try to control their choice. And the other day we saw that a father had cut off the head of his daughter uh, who had actually uh, tried to uh, uh, who tried to be with somebody of her choice. And he was yes. taking down the head. So look at our society. Look at the kind of awareness that we need in our society. And the okay. kind of patriotic and misogynist views that exist. Apart from in certain educated circles that we know of. I mean, so I think we have a long way to go. Thank <laughs> you.